So guys, just over a year since we were all here last discussing pretty much the same subject. So 12 months in. Joe, let me start with you. Uh, and for the benefit of the newcomers here, can you just briefly explain to us what a PIGO is and how that now differs from the soon to be extinct POGO? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, PIGO is uh, Philippine inland gaming. Uh, so it's directed towards the domestic market. Um, it is not full online gaming. The online component is remote to a land-based property, so uh, which includes sports betting, um, e-games, and bingo. Uh, unlike online, which is autonomous to land-based, this is a extension of land-based properties. So. In order to have a, a, a PIGO license, you must have an association with a land-based property and your player must be tagged uh, to a land-based uh, environment. Um, and, and this can either be an integrated resort, can be e-games, can be bingo outlets, uh, basically any property that's licensed by PAGCOR. Uh, to secure a license, um, you need to uh, pay a cash deposit of 50 million. There are also uh, application fees. And then within 18 months, you must be associated with 30 uh, land-based properties, um, 10 properties within the first uh, six months of operation. So a reasonably onerous um, regulatory task there, so dis uh, discouraging perhaps the, uh, the small, the bit player. When we, when we sat here last year, this is one for you, Brian, we only had, I believe, nine licenses. There are now 19. So my question to you is a uh, simple enough one. Is there enough meat on the local bone to feed everybody? Uh, well, that, that's uh, actually a very good question, uh, Rodney. And um, it's now actually 20. Uh, I, they, they just uh, approved another one, I th or we just saw it on the list maybe about a week, week and a half ago. So uh, as Rodney has correctly indicated, we started off with about eight, uh, eight or nine, and then today 20. So it is a very, very uh, crowded space. And I think given as uh, what Joe has mentioned, where uh, uh, and it may not just be the financial requirement, but it's really also operationally. You need to be in 10 to uh, 30 locations within uh, 18 months. Um, to a certain extent, PAGCOR has lowered uh, some of the requirements to be within the site. They, they, there's no longer any additional cost for the venue operator to have multiple e-games providers. Uh, but what has happened also, and I think we, uh, uh, for, for those that were based in the Philippines uh, towards the fourth quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter last year, we did kind of see some of the, uh, the side effect of having so many providers trying to gain uh, market share within what is a very limited market. Um, we had a lot of uh, text uh, spamming, um, you know, the SMS spamming, um, uh, stuff that was coming out on social media and so on. Uh, and, and so what, what happened here is, to a certain extent, we are also now feeling, not just from a, ourselves as providers, no, but, but really a broader effect. Now, coming out of that, uh, we now have things like uh, SIM registration acts to, be, to begin limiting, uh, let's say, the, the the uh, amount of messaging that's that's going on. Uh, so, um, so I, gu I guess going back uh, and I, uh, coming from our history, Phil Web as having been one of only two, and now with 20, it is indeed feeling uh, very, very crowded. Now I think uh, we are we are very envious of of, uh, of Elvis's uh, place here. Uh, because uh, pretty much uh, right now they're the uh, single player within within that space and and uh, doing very well. But it is today very very crowded. Okay, that, that's an interesting and very neat segue to Elvis. So <laughs> Elvis, uh, Digi Plus and Bingo, you are pretty much the sole player in this market. Would you like to tell us a little bit about your 
your uh, online um, ambitions for Bingo? Right. So uh, thanks for that question. Uh, um, actually, Bingo game is originated very long time ago. It's about a hundred of years ago. So it's originated in, in the church. In fact, the game was invented in the church for the fundraising purpose. Um, the bingo, the name itself, uh, means winning, means chance. It has all the positive uh, impressions uh, about the bingo. So it's originated in the, in the Europe. Uh, and then in the Philippines, right? In the Philippines, uh, we started from, I think, the, the group LRWC, now we call it DG Plus. It started from the traditional bingo, 75 ball face to face in the bingo hall, game by game, right? And then uh, about 20 years ago, there's an electronic bingo uh, going to the market. So it's, it's more or less like a slot machines, much faster, single player. Uh, there's more functions about extra balls, about extra pattern, et cetera. So, so after then, the bingo market has been uh, uh, not growing so much, I would say. So there's no much changes in the bingo market. Uh, so for us, it's quite a, how do you say, it's quite a, a coincidence for us to join the, the bingo market because at that time, I was just given a question, uh, what should we do in, in Philippine uh, gaming market? So uh, we did a research on uh, all the different game categories, uh, like sub uh, uh slots, uh, and then uh, e-casino, uh, the live game as well, the table games as well. And then we feel like to do Philippine market, the most important thing is you are facing the mass public. So you, are, you, are, you, you need to have, you need to grab a lot of uh, users uh, instead of just VIP users. So in those categories, we feel like bingo, although it's a gaming under Pacor, but it's the most known gaming category in the gaming market. So that's why uh, we pick bingo. We feel that this is a more uh, uh, easier and it's more acceptable to the mass public. So that's basically how we, we started this uh, bingo, bingo category and we want to join, we push uh, the license, we push the online for the bingo. And how is, how is uh, your online product doing in, in comparison, for example, to the figures that you were achieving in traditional venues? Right, so, so currently, uh, you know, we, uh, we just joined in, I just joined in uh, December 2021, and then uh, we launched our bingo product in Feb 2022, so just about a year. Uh, since there has been some progress, some growth about the, 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 the product, I would say the bingo market is really to attract the player, but there are a lot of them transferred into other games that we provided as well. Right, so it's just part of it, but we are very happy to, in this bingo market, we, ha we are very happy to welcome other players to join as well. So we want to promote the bingo as a concept, a gaming concept to the, to the, to the Philippine people. That's a fair comment. I mean, I think this is something that's probably not worrying you as much, Elvis, perhaps, as it does uh, Brian. Uh, when we talked about meat on the local bone uh, for the now 20, egos as opposed to the nine, we haven't really spoken about the biggest issue that we all face as operators, which is the illegal market, which does so without having to uh, deal with our regulator and pretty much comes in here and through social media primarily does seemingly what it likes. Now, how do you feel that we are as an industry and indeed as the, the regulator dealing with this, this threat to our business? Okay. Um yeah, we'll admit that we also did uh, try to aggressively go uh, and, and convert, no? uh, en engage basically uh, what would be uh, these networks, uh, yeah, because a lot of the, uh, the sort of market is uh, managed through agent systems, you know, ma marketing agents and networks, uh, affiliates and so on. So, so uh, over the past six, uh, nine months, uh, uh, we've tried very much uh, engaging, you know, these parties, uh, and and it's been a mix. No, um, um, uh, I think uh, to start with, uh, there there was a lot of expectation uh, with these parties as far as the shares sharing that they're getting out of GGR, uh, which uh, made it nearly or pretty much impossible for us to be able to engage also at those levels. 
But taking a look, I guess, at e-gaming and the segments that we're in, we're in, as Joe mentioned, you've got uh, you know, uh, digital casino or e-casino, you've got sports betting, and then you've got the live. Uh, really, um, there, there's a, there seems that the ripeness of going after the illegal seem to be a lot more, from our experience, within probably sportsbook, as opposed to it being traditional casino. Um, um, on, on our end, um, we really have not, and, and again, it may fall back into our own internal practices because we've had to try to ensure that we are keeping our venue operators a whole, no, as far as their share is concerned. Uh, so, um, to be honest, I'm not exactly sure to what extent the illegals within, let's say, e-casino is still dominating, as opposed to maybe in some of the other uh, segments, such as uh, maybe perhaps sports betting. Uh, there's still a lot of gray market uh, uh, cockfighting that's probably still taking place, you know. Uh, but, but from our end, um, it, it's not something that's, that's, uh, that's translating. It could be a lot of other factors. Um, I talked about SIM registration. We talked about uh, you know, the issues now about uh, making it a lot more difficult to move money through electronic payment channels. Uh, all of this tie into tightening up on the illegal side. Uh, on the PAGCOR side, we've had discussions with the regulator on this, especially as we're really seeing a, a large disparity across the uh, PAGCOR share between products. Uh, it's something that they're looking into, but uh, at, at this point in time, we are not aware of the direction that they're taking there. Uh, where uh, hopefully with a sort of like adjustment in some of the pack or share, it allows us to uh, bring back a lot more to our venue operators, to the players and so on. Uh, no, fair point. I mean, I think that probably uh, also concentrating on nullifying the illegal's ability to take money and um, remit money is the, is the key here. Joe, you've recently um, opened, reopened your, your sports betting brand, so what are the yeah. challenges that you're currently facing there? Uh, just on the illegals, I mean, they're currently our biggest competitor, uh, and not the other 19 operators, but the illegals. Um, for those that don't know, under the previous administration, uh, there is Executive Order 13, uh, which prohibits offshore sites operating within the Philippines. So these, uh, these people are operating illegal. Um, a lot of the, when you talk to regulators, they say, well, we, we block the sites, but it's the enablers of these illegals uh, that we need to go after. Now, the enablers are your platform providers, are your, if, if you say to your platform provider, do not allow geofence block Philippines, otherwise we will blacklist you in the country, start there. Go with the game providers, don't allow your games to be played in the country. Now I know the game providers go, well we're B2B, but you know, you, you also have some responsibility there. The biggest enablers are, are the payment solutions. And that would be Gcash and, and Maya, where most of these illegals are, are using these. Um, so there, there are areas where the governments can work, and, and probably the other area is the regulators themselves working together, whether it's um, Philippine Pagcor, Curacao, Isle of Man, Jib, Malta, where, where if you report back and, and have them take action against their own operators. Um, you know, that that's hurting us, it's uh, hurting the Philippines as a country and it's hurting the co community as well. No, I, I, again, fair comment. Um, I'm more interested, well, as interested, sorry, in how, how the sports betting is being, um, is being accepted by the Philippine public after many, many years with 
with one notable exception in, in uh, yes. MSW of, of essentially dealing with the legals and scraps of paper and cash accounts. How are you finding them accepting your um, ultra modern, high tech, mobile, and uh, sports betting platform? Uh, the players themselves are accepting. There is a, a, an education path to be taken. It's not a, an overnight thing. Um, we are going into other areas that will help educate our players in various sports. Uh, at the moment, the market is NBA basketball. Uh, it's tennis, it's table tennis. Right. So, you know, uh, there is a process of educating the, the players, whether it's through f free play sites, fantasy sports, uh, getting them out there to, to learn about other games. Uh, we, we do have a, a micro sports product coming out, which will help educate the players to learn more about other sports, uh, football, American football. Um, and it's, you know, we, we look at the US and, and, you know, sports booming at the moment. Uh, but it, it's a mature market when it comes to sports, so they understand it. Um, when you look at our, whether it's ours or any of our competitors' sports sites, it, it can be a bit overwhelming. You're, you're sure. looking at odds and all the side bets, and, and they can be decimal fractions, or, and you go, what the hell is this? Um, so, yeah, there is an education process, making it a, a bit simpler for the player and also introducing new products to the market. Excellent. Thank you, Joe. I mean, this one is, is, this one is generally for, for all three of you. We've, um, we've had our product offerings within our, with our, in our online, uh, generally casino slots, table games, and now sports. What else are we anticipating? I believe, Joe, you, you made a comment prior to this about the MGC closing their horse racing product, you know, traditionally um, a very big part of Philippine betting culture. Do you see horse racing being allowed to be bought in and added to your offerings on a stream basis from overseas? Uh, we'd like to see it. Um, in, in a few weeks, we, we start streaming dog racing 24-7. Uh, we'd like to have the ability to, to start streaming uh, horse racing, and not only to support us and the sports industry, but you know, there's still another uh, racetrack in, in uh, Batangas, yep. which it, it can also help them uh, to offer streaming through their services as well, off track betting. Um, we don't see it uh, taking over. From, from the breeding, local breeding, uh, and the actual sport of horse racing locally, but to, to supplement what's happening. Yeah, that, I mean, that was always originally the concern, I think, the MGC had, that, that they would uh, suffer a large lack of interest in, in homebred racing, which, of course, they've probably been somewhat uh, involved in by stopping uh, San yes. Lazaro. Um, Brian, to you, new new products. Are you are you anticipating anything outside the the old casino and table games? Uh, well, um, we're seeing a lot of uh, interest and possible direction into uh, live. You know? uh, live and live here will uh, run uh, maybe a broad uh, uh, gamut. No? Uh, I mean, uh, I think in terms of, for example, live bingo, it's shown a very very strong. Uh, performance uh, last year or two years ago, you had the cockfighting, live cockfighting, and so we're. It's it's very interesting to begin seeing variations. Like today, there is the uh, the live billiard product, which uh, Pagcor has licensed uh, to to try to apply the uh, sort of uh, paramutual style uh, betting onto these sort of uh, activities. Um, so uh, from from our understanding, uh, I think there's. Uh, it's not, uh, uh, there are other service providers that are probably looking at, apart from creating or, or 
performing betting on those, but to also organize some of these tournaments or some of these games themselves. Uh, so, so there's a combination content and gaming to it. Although there probably needs the, uh, some care needs to be done to draw the line between promoter and gaming platform to you know manage matters like uh, game fixing and so on. So. Um, um, so you'll have the live sports component, we think. I think um, given the saturation with, with eCasino, uh, we will probably see a number of, uh, and, and we're starting to hear this also, a number of live studios or live studio type services that might come into the market uh, soon. Uh, so, um, so a lot of that. Um, with, with the cockfighting, uh, one of the comments that we got, uh, funnily, you know, and, and was that they felt that because it was live, there's lesser game fixing uh, <laughs> taking place. Uh, uh, you know, uh, but but uh, I, I don't want to comment further on that. Uh, but uh, but yeah, um, and and so people have latched onto that uh, the live component, the high uh, frequency, uh, rapid uh, style betting. Uh, not just with bingo, but you know, uh, that sort of thing. It, it seems to be everybody or a lot of people seem to be wanting to be in that, in that space right now. Um, this is one for you, Elvis. Uh, Pigos really were born from the necessity to maintain revenues. Um, whilst our traditional gaming e-games or bingo were closed down during the pandemic. So my question to you is what has been the effect on your, or these land-based venues because of the easy availability of this online option. You still see a big future for traditional bingo and e-bingo and e-games, despite, as I say, easy access from mobiles. Right, so I think that's uh, actually the, the, the future direction of our company, right? So, um, uh, so we already launched Bingo Plus, it's going very well. And then uh, for the, there are two major directions of our company this year. One direction is we expanded to multiple product lines. Um, we just launched a sports book. Uh, it's called, uh, it was in the, our family, it's called Arena Plus. Uh, it's a new sports betting product we launched last December. Uh, we see the number going on well. Uh, so we are looking at that. Uh, we are pr planning a lot of resources ar around Arena Plus for this year. So that's one thing. Uh, we expand to other multiple product lines. Another thing is we want our offline and online aligned. That was a very interesting question. The reason actually we chose uh, uh, ARWC or DigiPlus as a platform is because of its branches. Uh, during the pandemic, they have around 150 branches. Uh, of course, the pandemic hurt them, hurt them a lot, right? So, but we feel like this could be a very strong basis for online business. So that's why we enter. And then uh, we invented our, our online platform. So the direction is we want to provide the same product experiences, same payment services, same promotion services across online and offline. So this is what we're doing this year. Uh, uh, we are looking into all the machines. Uh, that's a very new area for, 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 for me and for the team. Uh, but that's the one direction we are going on. And, and Brian, for you with the e-games venues, are you finding them relying more on their online um, revenues or are they still maintaining steady? Um, actually, it has been maintaining uh, pretty steadily. Uh, but um, we, we really will need that uh, combination. Okay, so, so there is, it, it is definitely complementing each other. Um, but if I had to uh, cut it across segments, and, and this is also one of the reasons why we also did go out and obtain our own uh, sports betting license uh, ourselves, uh, um, is that um, while today I would say, and, and realistic, I mean, in truth, uh, if we took a, uh, took a look at our e-gaming GGR across the venues, uh, in total, the performance of the venues are, are already approaching pre-pandemic levels and even, in effect, exceeding. No? But it's really a combination of uh, land-based and um, online being attributed to those venues, uh, and for which today, 80-20, 70-30 in favor of land-based. No? But if we, had to if we had to go after newer markets, 
Okay, uh, you know, the, the mobile only uh, uh, age segment and, and what people are playing on, on mobile, uh, you know, so, so definitely a younger set. Sure. They don't want to be going necessarily into venues and so on and so forth. Um, we need to think out the product that we provide in there, no? um, uh, which, which on one end is also sports betting. Uh, at the same time, um, the venues themselves need to be reinvented. So, so it's almost like you've got a cycle here. No? Um, so like for our venues, I think very similar to what uh, uh, LR has done, is uh, we were looking at conducting uh, lifestyle games within our venues themselves and making, uh, let's say, the, the running of those live games uh, an attraction in itself. Right. No? So people come in, can sit at a bar, have a drink while you're doing something in the background live. No? Uh, uh, that sort of thing. No? Uh, but, but it's really also having to rethink it. Um, um, it the, the model that, that we have, uh, we've had over the past 10, 12 years, clearly, uh, that, that needs to be reinvented, yeah. yeah. Okay, I have a, <coughs> a, possibly a final question for you. Maybe, Joe, you can take this one to start off with. Um, we've alluded previously to the regulator and the fact that POGOs are um, probably dodo-like and disappearing, if not totally extinct. Um, we have, as we've all agreed, a fairly comprehensive regulatory framework for our POGOs here now. So is there any good reason why they shouldn't be allowing us to operate in other markets? Uh, none. Um, you know, we, we uh, all of us here, we have uh, robust systems. Uh, we have AML controls. We have responsible gaming. We have very strong KYC processes, payments. Um, there would be no reason not to allow us to extend what we're doing here in the Philippines to to other legal jurisdictions. Um, no reason, but do you think that we will be allowed to? Is this something that you've had conversations about, Joe, or indeed yourself, Brian? Um, we, we would like to lobby the regulator to, to allow all of us uh, to go into other markets as well. Um, one, it, it, would be, it would bring additional income into the country. Uh, I think the way we operate our businesses, um, we are compliant uh, with all aspects of, of the regulation, and we're probably the ideal partners for the government to allow this to happen. For sure. Couldn't help but agree. That's the reason I ask. Yeah. <laughs> Hoping that someone out there is listening. Yeah. Uh, we're sort of coming to the end of this session, gentlemen, so there may be some questions from the floor, but before we, before we close, is there anything that you'd like to add, Elvis? So just talking about the, the, uh, the illegals, right? So I think this is an issue that we, we are all concerned. Uh, um, to my point, there are two kinds of illegals. One is, um, you know, they, they bat in the chat group. There's an agent, um, very simpler form. Uh, so this is just a user pattern, we call player pattern. It will be overcome gradually by our new technology and new platform. So that's something happening in sports betting, right? So I realized there's a lot of uh, uh, private chat groups, they bet in the group, NBA matches for the next day at a certain rate, etc. So um, our partners are worried about it. I told them, no problem. You know, our platform is better. They can play live betting. We just make the platform simpler so they can play. So gradually, we'll change the user pattern. Then there's another form of illegals is, of course, they have uh, uh, competitive uh, products. Uh, they, they have a lot of experiences uh, uh, overseas and also in the locals. They have resources in the locals. I think those are the ones that need our combined efforts. Uh, upstream and downstream, the payment, we talk about the payment and also the regulatory departments that we work together. Uh, I think this really hurts us all, a lot. Uh, uh, because, you know, just mentioned about the, the GGR percentage they can get um, and then how they can spread it into the provinces. Uh, so this is really the challenge that, that we are facing. 
Yes, I, un I understand that representation is being made by, by some of the players in the market, as I say, mainly trying to attack the payment solutions. If people can't get money into the, into the book or to the casino and they can't get money out, they're going to cease to want to play. Um, so we can only hope that that happens sooner rather than later. Bad for us as operators, bad for the regulator, bad for the economy. At, at, at the moment, we're all, all speaking to the government and to the regulator as individuals. I, I think there is a need amongst all of us to have an association where we, we can speak as a, a combined voice uh, and we're certainly open to that, and I'm sure. Well, I'm very glad that you just volunteered, Joe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you would be the ideal first chairman. I, I, I'm happy to speak. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, uh, speaking to the government uh, as a combined voice uh, where we can air our concerns and make recommendations. It, it happens in other countries. Um, we, we have AGMA and... and um, in, in the US and in Australia um, that not only we use to air our concerns, but to, to bring new ideas uh, to the government as well. Um, you know, I believe in things like a, a digital identity for players that we can all use sure. where we don't have to go through all these identification processes which all the time. Which is, of course, something, once again, the illegal casinos are not having to go through. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I'm open, fellas. Okay. <laughs> Brian, you up, you up for that as well? Um, well, yeah. I mean, uh, definitely. And, and I'll, you know, we, we've sort of, like, uh, painted the regulator in a, uh, you know, not, uh, not so bright light, uh, I think, in the course of conversation. But... But uh, when, when you do get a chance to sit uh, with PACOR, uh, which I think we have yes. all managed to do in our own individual capacities, uh, and, and you do uh, sit with uh, Chairman Tenko, uh, and keeping in mind that Chairman Tenko did, you know, came from the private sector, you know, P&L thinking, how to raise revenues, um, and also realizing that uh, they came in a little late. No? They, they, they were only appointed three, four months after the, the president sat. And so, uh, based on what we're seeing publicly, privately, there, there's clearly a lot of effort to address, I think, some of the um, uh, gaps that, that, uh, in regulation that, that uh, uh, came to rise, uh, coming out you know, it, it was a tough environment that we came from. You know, pandemic, yeah. people couldn't meet, uh, people were chasing down revenue, PACOR was being uh, pressured to provide uh, social welfare and so on. And so we, we look at PACOR today uh, and, and Chairman Tenko's remarks around having to raise revenue. Um, and he's also made it very clear to ourselves that, look, uh, he is very much focused on the welfare of the, uh, what, what we're calling the retail gaming venues, no? or the, the retail licensees. Uh, because uh, he does see the value, but also at the same time, he is looking at trying to figure out how to expand or increase the revenue contributions coming out of that. And we've definitely expressed our support uh, behind that. From my understanding today, uh, uh, in terms of product, nothing is off the table. I guess except isabong for the time except being. Right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, but uh, yeah. even that, from my understanding, is being uh, reassessed. Uh, but but clearly to try to do away with the the effects, you know, the, the the negative effects. But uh, but yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we we do see Pancor as a partner. Not not so much. You know, it's them us versus them. They, they are our partner in everything we do. For sure. Yeah. Well, one of our advantages is a strong regulator. I yeah. Mean, that's, that's the Philippine advantage at the present moment. Yeah. Gentlemen, can I thank you very much indeed for participating and the very best of luck for the rest of 2023. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.